Kicking off the list at number 10. Going back to volume one of the Incredible Hulk issue 340 titled Vicious Circle, we find the Hulk and Rick Jones out in a blizzard. They're trying to drive, but it seems like they're only going in circles. Meanwhile, the Hulk is going nuts. He needed to get out of there. Like when you have to stretch your legs on a road trip, I get it, right? So he blasts the roof right off and the X-Men just happen to be in the neighborhood flying by. The Hulk almost hits them mid air after he jumps off. I would say good thing he didn't hit them, but he continued flying by and then hit a Pan Am pass your plane so it's like Mm, maybe he should have hit them then. So the X-Men were busy handling that, obviously, while on the ground, the Hulk landed and caused more damage. Wolverine tracked the beast down, and believe it or not, the Hulk almost snuck up on him. He couldn't catch the Hulk's scent, so it was really dangerously close. Wolverine popped his claws, turned, and then sliced the Hulk's arm, and they both looked at each other. And Wolverine, he walked away at this point. He retracted his claws. He's like, hey, remember who you are, Logan? Remember what you're doing? You're the bigger man here. And he's like, breathes, and he walks away, and then the Hulk jumps out at him and then starts it all over again. He thunderclaps Wolverine's ears to smithereens. His enhanced senses, this for sure, got the ball rolling, got him pretty upset. After this, naturally, there is mayhem. They take turns beating the crap out of each other until the fight was eventually at an end because it was broken up. But Wolverine for sure won this round. He tried walking away initially. He's a victim here, folks. Don't forget that. For nine. Deadpool. The canceled Deadpool 3 movie would have been pretty amazing over at Fox. We would have seen Logan and Wade on a road trip from hell. It would have been much better than the last time we saw them on screen together. Yeah. But in the comics, Deadpool and Logan have, of course, bumped heads, like in Cable and Deadpool issue 44, for example. The two are fighting at a Hydra base, and Wolverine straight up impales Wade to the wall. It's a fun comic. Wade spends the first half with his head off, just getting kicked around like a soccer ball. It's all fun and games. But finally, Logan keeps Wade still once he shoves his claws through him and into the wall. That ought to get your attention sometimes. Number eight, Spider-Man. In Spider-Man vs. Wolverine, released in 1987, we see Peter slinging across the city. He's trying to snap some pics for the bugle, he's looking for his light, trying to get that angle right, but all of a sudden, trouble calls. He hears a young woman scream, so he zips down, and he finds the owners of a grocery store dead on the spot. So he ends up following that lead, and it brings him right into Logan's path. Now, Logan has already been doing his own plan at this point, and then in comes this kid wearing pajamas, shooting webs at people. So the two heroes now have no choice but to go loud and proud. They both fight off criminals together and it's a fun time, but once they realize they're too late, Charlemagne had already gotten there, there's lots of bodies, so Logan naturally blames Spider-Man for ruining the whole thing. He's like, if it wasn't for you, this would not have happened in the first place. Pretty deep words. Spider-Man fires back though, he's not taking any of this. The two walk separate ways, but it's not over yet. Wolverine's meditating, he's feeling bad. Spider-Man's in bed, tossing and turning. He tries to take out Charlie himself, but Peter stops him. Well, he tries to. They fight in a graveyard for a few pages, but when Peter turns around to hit Wolverine one last time, he accidentally hits Charlie instead. I'm counting this as a loss because Peter wanted to fight. He engaged and he swung without looking. And now he can't get that image out of his head and neither can we. Number seven, the X-Men. Okay, when I say the X-Men, I mean like all of them. Big yikes. Old Man Logan, one of the best storylines of all time, also one of the darkest. In a grim future where supervillains are taking over the planet, Mysterio pulls out perhaps one of his best tricks, if I do say so myself. If this happened in the MCU, kids would throw up gummy worms. They would be mortified. Mysterio tricks Logan into fighting the X-Men. He makes Logan believe that they're all supervillains, so Logan kills them all. He feels horrible, I mean obviously, so he runs off into the woods and he tries to take himself out. That's how bad he felt, but he vowed to never pull the claws out again after that didn't work. Even Santa Claus 2, starring Tim Allen, he's like, I can't do it. I made a vow, I can't do it. Number six, Wolverine. Hey, question YouTube, if you fought yourself, who would win? In Logan, we got to witness Wolverine fight another Wolverine, but in the Age of Ultron comic, it was actually much darker, much more brain scratching at least. In Age of Ultron in the comic, we get to see this dark future where the Avengers are getting whooped. Ultron is using Vision as a conduit from the future, like the world's most painful game of broken telephone. The Avengers don't really see a way to get to Ultron and stop him, so they send Sue Storm and Logan back in time to find a solution. Now Logan wants to just straight up kill Hank Pym, just to make sure Ultron is never created. But in doing so, this opens up a dark alternate future, so when they go back, this new timeline that they've now created made the kree Skrull War move to Earth. So they run into the defenders of that timeline and also Logan of that timeline. Wolverine versus Wolverine, what a time. 
The time traveling Wolverine beat alternate Wolverine, so everybody wins or loses. I'm not sure in this case. My head hurts, to be honest. Let's move on. Number five, Teen Mutant. He doesn't have a name, so we'll just refer to him as Mr. Teen Mutant Boy, whatever you want to call him. He doesn't have a name because he's only around for one issue, spoiler alert, despite having an insane power. Let's talk about it. Ultimate X-Men issue 41. Now at first glance, he looks like a regular kid. He's got posters on his wall, one of which is Wolverine with the caption, be different which is pretty amazing given how his day is about to go down. He wakes up, he's ready for school, he's looking for breakfast because his, he doesn't know how to make food. Apparently his mom is like the only one that can make him breakfast. So his mom's nowhere to be seen, so he doesn't eat. Only a pile of her clothes remain on the ground and he's like, okay. So he goes to school, he doesn't call the police like a psychopath. If you ever see this, definitely call for help, absolutely. He continues on, he goes to school, but on the way there, he sees a collar on the ground on the sidewalk, but no animal. Again, more articles of clothing just strewn about. But then finally, he sees people. Okay, he's not going crazy, this is a good sign. We have real, like live people, lovely. But I bet he wished that that wasn't the case. So he has this fantastic ability where if you're just near this guy, you don't survive to talk about it. He hears it from the guy in the poster himself, the be different guy, Wolverine. He finds him ducking out in a cave and breaks the news to him. What happened was when he hit puberty, he developed a specific mutation that radiates a series of toxins and acid like poisons. And it basically wipes out any organic tissue. It turns it into vapor. So the amount of people that he ended up accidentally killing that day was in the 260s number, yeah. So he doesn't last for long because, well, Wolverine came out of that cave all alone. You do the math. Imagine your idol coming into a cave to kill you. It's not bad, I don't know, could be worse. If Hugh Jackman killed me, I'd be like, uh, okay. That's not bad. Number four, Lobo. We've talked about comic crossovers quite a bit here on Top 10 Nerd. They're a blast, I mean, for the most part. DC vs. Marvel showed us some pretty entertaining battles. I mean, we got to see Captain America vs. Batman, Spider-Man vs. Superboy, and of course, Lobo vs. Wolverine. The third issue out of the four, we find Logan badmouthing Lobo's favorite bar. Logan is talking smack and Lobo interrupts him with a nice chain to the chest. That oughta hurt. Wolverine ends up walking out of the bar smoking a cigar. Also, he's alive. How did this happen? We're not sure how this one ended up going down as most of this fight happened behind the bar, but to kill an immortal man, Good on you, James. Number three, Jean Grey. This next one played out in live action in everybody's favorite X-Men movie, X-Men The Last Stand. So good. It's not. Showed us Wolverine taking out Jean Grey in a mercy type way in order to stop the Dark Phoenix from causing mayhem. Now this of course went down in the comics as well and it was much better on page than on screen. You can find it in New X-Men issue 148. Wolverine is telling Jean that Scott still loves her, although he's just maybe a bit confused at this moment. Jean is weak, she's saying she can't breathe, that she has this terrible feeling, that she feels scared and weird, that there's voices inside of her head. She knows she's dying. It's a really sad part in the comics. And Wolverine can't take the pain on himself but he can take the pain away for now. Hugh Jackman is a wonderful actor, don't get me wrong, so is Fam K. Jansen, but the comic is way harder than the movie. This whole scene here gets my throat that little, like, uh, I get a little tight throat feeling. So let's move on from really sad to really gross, shall we? Let's finish off like that. Number two, The Hulk. Mark Miller's Old Man Logan. We talked about it a little bit earlier. Let's talk about it some more, it's good. It begins in volume three of Wolverine on issue 66 to be specific, and this is a future where supervillains have won. They did it! Good job, supervillains, nice. Hulk and She-Hulk had kids, the Hulklings, who, not nice, we don't wanna talk about that. They would beat the crap out of you if you didn't pay rent, basically. Everybody had their own territory at this point, so Logan had to pay up. So Hulk gang ended up taking out Logan's family because they were bored. They're also a little messed up in the head if you didn't already put that together. So Logan heads back and sees the Hulk, and he's like, you know what, no more games, no more talking, I'm here to get this done. Logan gets Banner right through the old chest plate, but we all know what happens next. He hulks out, and then he eats Logan. If you can't beat him, you gotta swallow him. That's the rule, right? Now you think this would be the end of it, but that's not what this list is. Now is it? No, you already know it's about to change. That's when Logan pops out from inside Banner, the old C-section from hell. So basically if you eat Wolverine, just know that it's coming out one of any way he wants, essentially. And finally coming in at number one, everybody. What if Wolverine killed everybody, the entire Marvel Universe? Could he do it? Would he do it? Yes and yes. Written by Jimmy Robinson, released in 2006, this What If is based on Mark Miller's Enemy of the State series, taking place in Wolverine Volume 3 from issues 20 to 25. Now in that story, Wolverine is used to try and hunt down the Avengers, the X-Men, just everybody. The Hand and the Hydra were using him as a weapon. 
Baron von Strucker used him to steal documents from Reed Richards. It was a whole plan, right? It was a whole thing. But S.H.I.E.L.D. was able to capture him and heal him. In this what if, we see a world where Wolverine kept working for Hydra in the hand. In this alternate timeline, everybody gets wiped out. Nick Fury is telling Cap and the others, I mean, sure, Hydra in the hand is a concern, but like, we need to stop Wolverine first, like ASAP. That should be the first thing on our list right now. Thing is, Wolverine kills Spider-Man. He kills Iron Fist. He takes off Captain America's arm and leg because whenever Wolverine is in trouble, Hydra just teleports him away. You can't really hit him. Susan Storm tried to make this force field trap that kept Logan in the same spot with Magneto helping out as well. But while they were planning that, Wolverine snuck in and attacked them all through the floors. So everybody gets messed up there as well. Magneto and Sue Storm, gone and gone. Captain America gets claws in the head. Also gone. So Kitty Pride phases her hand into Logan's head and kills him that way. You gotta end the list on a horrible note, you know? Cause why not? Kicking off the list at number 10. He's fought the green guy quite a few times, okay? And for this one, it's not really a fight per se. Savage Wolverine began back in March 2013 from Frank Cho. The series ran for 23 issues. Now when a S.H.I.E.L.D. geological department vessel with Shauna the She-Devil crashes onto the Forbidden Island, Wolverine wakes up now in Savage Land. His claws are immediately out, as they should be, and this comic wastes no time. A Velociraptor attacks him right away. What a rude awakening. He saves a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, takes off a head or two, and then heads back to the ship. Shauna the She-Devil greets him with joy and then fills him in. She was assisting a team of surveyors in mapping out the western part of the Savage Land when all their gear went dark, just like that. Some machine in the land center was creating a dampening field, so now they're all stuck there. Shauna gets killed, but later on resurrected by the Neanderthals. Wolverine continues to find this machine, but he has no idea that she came back to life. But when Shauna meets up with Amadeus Cho in issue 3, some new info comes to light. That machine is also powering the jail cell for a powerful ancient alien in the mountain. And Wolverine is about to shut it down. How lovely. He takes on some giant gorillas, and when he gets close to the machine, the Hulk shows up. They're about to talk it out when one of those giant gorillas returns and then bites the Hulk. They fight it out a bit, and then Wolverine jumps in and quickly ends the action with one swift shink to the brain. That ought to do it. Number nine. Captain America. Wolverine Origins began back in 2006. It ran for 50 issues and it kicks off with Wolverine on a mountaintop with the Muramasa Blade. Now he's had all these memories returned to him from the events of House of M and now he wants a little payback on all those responsible for messing with his life. He took on Nuke in the Vietnam fields and then in issue four, Captain America joins the battle. They take turns bashing each other in, metal slashing around, they're just punching each other in the head. It's good fun. Cap gets the upper hand on Logan when he crushes the tendons in Wolverine's forearms, but a mighty kick to the hematoma lump on Steve's thigh buys Wolverine quite a bit of time to recover. Cap catches up and the fighting resumes, but Wolverine has the blade this time around, and an injured Captain America stands no chance. If it wasn't for the X-Men intervening at the last second, Cap would have lost a lot harder. And before we continue on with this list, if you want to go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, that would be awesome. You know it helps us out so much, and then in turn we can help you out and bring you that nerdy goodness. So hit that thumbs up, you guys are the best. Back to the list. Number eight, Cyclops. The X-Men Schism storyline from writer Jason Aaron comes a five-part story that begins with Wolverine acting as Cyclops' bodyguard at an international arms control conference in Switzerland. Mid-speech, Kid Omega returns, and he makes everybody start spilling all their horrible, deep, dark secrets. Cyclops and Logan are immune to this because, you know, superpowers. Sentinels are soon deployed worldwide, and a new Black King of the Hellfire Club is elected. Cade Kilgore. Cade's first plan of attack is to surprise the X-Men at the opening of a mutant history museum, and then the world is chaos. The only mutant left standing is the young Idea Conquo. Wolverine tells her to run, but Cyclops argues for her to stay as she's the only one that could possibly save everybody there. Idy ends up taking out the Hellfire henchmen, she saves the people, but Cyclops and Wolverine are arguing over if this was the right call to make. As the Sentinel approaches Utopia, Logan is imploring Scott to join the other kids and leave the island because he plans to blow it to smithereens. They're not seeing eye to visor, so Scott makes it personal to get Logan's attention. He says, out of the blue, she never loved you by the way, you always frightened her. Harsh words. So Wolverine snaps back, suggesting that if Jean Grey was there at that moment, she would be more afraid of Cyclops. Scott responds by blasting Wolverine's face pretty much off. Wolverine, sans face at this point, still is on top of Scott laying into him. I would say this is a tie at this point, but seeing how they look after the X-Men save them, Scott's in much worse condition. 
That's why you don't melt off Logan's face, man. It doesn't end well. The guy can heal. Just stop. Number seven, Quicksilver. After Quicksilver took the keys out of Cyclops' ride in Ultimate X-Men issue three, you would think he had successfully thwarted the X-Men. All he has to do now was evade a hefty optic blast and hit the road. That was no problem seeing how he's the fastest man on the planet, but being the fastest doesn't mean you always have the upper hand. Sometimes you have to be the smartest. Wolverine was waiting for this moment to surprise Petro. Logan just stood there with his claws out, he stood perfectly still, and Quicksilver ran right into him. When he asked Wolverine what he was doing here, Wolverine responded, ah, wouldn't you like to know? And then he slashed him down to the ground. And then Quicksilver wasn't seen for quite a bit. Number six, Silver Surfer. The first time we see zombie Wolverine was in Ultimate Fantastic Four issue 22. He got bit by zombie Hawkeye and Captain America, so his healing factor wasn't enough to save the day. Now when the Silver Surfer came poking around, everybody wanted a piece. Literally, they were so hungry and this guy was like the holy grail of snacks. Hulk took the first bite and soon after, Logan and the rest of the team dug in. They all then got cosmic powers and a full belly. Nice. Logan's idea of peeling back the candy coating and getting into the tender morsels inside surely helped put the plan into motion. Also, ew. Number five, Iron Fist. In New Avengers issue 15, a friendly bout between Iron Fist and Wolverine is underway. No claws, no fist, no problem. It's a fun training exercise. It draws readers' attention and even other heroes in the issue as well. Wolverine is encouraging Iron Fist to tap out, but it's no use. Wolverine knocks him straight to the ground, saying he was only at a six this entire time. Out of breath, Iron Fist replies that he too was only at a three, so... Huh. Out of breath, Iron Fist replies unconfidently that he too was only at a three. Okay. I don't want to be around either of these guys when they're at a one. No thanks. Number four, Age of Apocalypse Cyclops. Doesn't matter which universe you're indulging in, odds are Wolverine and Cyclops will go at it at some point. In Age of Apocalypse, Earth 295, Cyclops was mad that Wolverine was trying to get his girlfriend. Classic bro stuff. Similar vibes to the Ultimate Universe, only this ends much worse for Scott. When Gene chose to be with Logan instead of Scott, and as if that wasn't already good enough for Wolverine, he decided to slash out one of Cyclops' eyes, truly leaving him a Cyclops. Nothing like having that reminder on your face. What a harsh way to get dumped. Number three, Namor. Namor the Submariner, volume one, issue 24, titled Green War, was written by John Byrne, and it features Namor returning to Earth to investigate a Hilrithri invasion, which was the sentient plant race. Now they got Wolverine and forced him to fight Namor. Even on page, we're told Namor's strength is far greater than Wolverine's, but Logan has speed and therefore gets the upper hand. The fight was interrupted by the Sorcerer Master Khan who took out the plant dudes and brought Wolverine back to normal. But if this had continued, Wolverine would have kept slashing and kept healing. No water guns would have helped you this time, Namor. Number two, Ultimate Cyclops. Ultimate Wolverine gets pretty jealous and he takes things to a new height, literally, when he discovers that Jean Grey truly loves Cyclops. So Logan, now there was a deep rift growing between the two of them. So Charles was like, hey, why don't the both of you just go to Savage Land, work your stuff out, have some bro time, maybe become best friends. I don't know. They did not work it out or become best friends at first. See, what initially happened was Wolverine let Cyclops fall to his death off a cliff just so he can get Jean back. That's like some Lion King teen drama stuff. That's wild. Cyclops survived and then exposed Wolverine to the crew and then made him feel horrible about what he'd done, even letting Logan stay on the team. What a weird punishment. So Wolverine ended up changing his ways and becoming a leader, eventually becoming a role model for the younger X-Men, being friends with Cyclops later on. All it took was letting him fall to his death first. That's it. And finally, number one, Shang-Chi. We're all counting down the days to see the newest MCU hero hit the big screen. Shang-Chi was first introduced to readers back in 1973, Marvel Special Edition. Since then, he's earned himself a spot on the Avengers and of course has appeared in other comics from time to time. Like in X-Men Volume 2, Issue 62, titled Games of Deceit and Death. The X-Men seek out the help of Shang-Chi to take down Sebastian Shaw, but in comic book fashion, a little scuffle was to be had first. Wolverine compliments the punk on his first blow, even telling him that the first blood is his. But when you throw down with Wolverine, you throw down with the best there is. Wolverine has him pinned down and he's ready to finish off Shang-Chi, but luckily Storm came in and just settled it. What an exciting way to meet the X-Men. Damn. 
Kicking off the list at number 10, Hulk. When DC and Marvel combine powers, it's an odd but beautiful time. In DC's special series issue 27 titled The Monster and the Madman, Angry Orphan Bruce vs Angrier Orphan Bruce, who comes out on top? Well, given the title of this list, you already know what happens, but how? That's the question. Bruce Banner was working at a division of Wayne Research. He was developing a gamma gun, said to cure diseases. So Banner was hoping he could fix his mean green problem while at work. Sounds like a plan. But when the Joker comes in and steals the gamma gun, Bruce goes green, makes a mess, and in turn, Batman shows up to save the day. You can't just punch the Hulk until he goes to sleep this time around. You won't even get close. So Batman, in fact, does get close. A little too close for comfort, as his spine was seconds away from snapping like a pencil. So Batman used a chemical that would knock the beast out. Thing is, the Hulk can hold his breath for a long time. So in order for him to inhale, Batman had to kick him right in the stomach. And then down goes the green Goliath. And before we continue on with this list, you guys know the drill. If you want to go and give us a thumbs up, that would be awesome. It really does help us out a lot at this channel. And obviously, we like throwing all that nerdy content back. So it's a nice circle of love. Hit that thumbs up. Thank you. Back to the list. Number nine, Nightwing. Coming from the Court of Owls storyline where a body was found with a message. Bruce Wayne will die tomorrow. That's what it said, written right there on the wall. Harry Potter, Chamber of Secrets style. It's ooh, so mysterious, okay. Pretty concerning warning, but when Batman finds Dick Grayson's DNA under the victim's fingernail, he has even more questions. It's later revealed that William Cobb is the great grandfather of Dick Grayson. Spoilers, right off the hop. But Batman is trying to piece together this mystery alone. He's not sharing all these details, and Dick is obviously upset. He's yelling at Bruce, he's demanding to shed more light on this fact that he just dropped on him. Bruce interrupts him with a left hook to the jaw, knocking Nightwing down. He did this simply to check one of Nightwing's teeth for an owl logo. Now, to be fair, he did have the owl in his tooth. Bruce was right. Dick was supposed to be a Talon growing up, but I'm pretty sure there's other ways to check a tooth here. I mean, you have tech that can see through cars. I don't know, just tell him to lean back. Be like, what's that? And scan his mouth, that's it. Although a surprise bat punch works too. That clearly works as well. Number eight, Wonder Woman. Rich Orphan vs. Dog Daughter of Zeus. This one is shocking, I'll admit. Coming from Batman Confidential issue 53, Batman is facing the team and right from the get-go, trying not to say right off the bat, he says the woman is the most powerful. Right on. The woman being Wonder Woman. He decides he has to take her down first, but after his knuckles shatter, Bruce realizes it might be a little harder than he thinks. She still needs to breathe though, so there is hope. Batman beats her without any heavy metal knight armor, anything like that, and then after he gets Superman's powers, he takes out the entire team again. All these superhumans, it's always air. It's always air. That's the weakness. You just got to knock the wind out of them and then they're good. Like every kid in the playground when they get winded, they're like, Arr! and then they have to go home. Number seven, Green Arrow. Whenever Batman breaks his one rule, it's pretty alarming. He did it a few times in the early comics. I mean, he pushed a guy into acid, he threw another guy into a knife, and then he broke a dude's neck with one kick. It was pretty intense, but nothing comes close to the time that Batman beat Green Arrow half to death just for Superman's birthday. Yeah, hear this one out. This takes place in Superman and Batman's absolute power storyline. It takes place in an alternate timeline where Superman and Batman were raised as evil rulers instead of the protectors that they are now. It's a stressful but pretty awesome time, I gotta admit. They're hunting down Green Arrow and the fight, as you would guess, doesn't last too long. Archer almost gets Superman as well. He comes very close. Clark catches the arrow and then moments later, Kryptonite explodes out of it. The classic Loki Hawkeye trick. It's good. Always works. Batman gets upset here. He says, hey, if you just hurt him, I'll kill you. So that's pretty crazy for Bruce. That's like 0 to 100 for Bruce Wayne. They brawl it out a bit and then when Archer goes down, Bruce says get up because he wants more. At that point, I would sh my jeans. That's crazy. He's so angry. Now, this is when Superman flies in and turns Archer into dust with his laser vision. He's telling Green Arrow's corpse to obey or die. So it's very intense. Batman did all the heavy lifting here. And it's even more twisted when you remember that he gave Archer up to Superman as a birthday present. Number six, the Ninja Turtles. Batman beating up the Foot Clan and coming face to face with Shredder is pretty awesome. But when he meets the turtles, he has no idea what exactly he's facing. He's like, are these good guys or bad guys? I'm very confused. All he sees are giant moody turtle monsters with weapons, just like eating pizza. So of course, a brawl goes down. It also doesn't help that the turtles were breaking and entering into a pizza joint. Like you're literally breaking the law, you're a bad guy. Batman thinks these guys are villains, so he takes them on all at the same time. He impressed the turtles while doing so, and it takes Master Splinter's arrival just to calm things down. But even then, Batman's like, a rat? No sweat, I'll fight you too. Batman vs. Ratman, let's do it. He doesn't beat up Splinter, don't worry, because Splinter makes a run for it, which is crazy. The fact that Splinter and the turtles had to run away from Bruce Wayne, that's awesome. We had to include it on this list. Until next time, Batman, just eating pizza.
Number five, The Punisher. I would pay thousands of dollars to see this on screen. No problem, debit, boop. Punisher Batman Deadly Knights, written by Chuck Dixon. We get to see John Romita Jr. draw Batman during his 37 years at Marvel Comics, which is amazing. So both of these heroes were on the same side, more or less. They wanted bad guys off the street, but the way that Frank Castle does that by spraying, you know, plethora of bullets, Batman likes to break an arm or two, so they're a little bit different. So they get into a disagreement over Batman's one rule, and Frank is moments away from taking out the Joker, and then Batman intervenes and saves the Joker's life, which is kind of crazy. Batman lets Frank connect one hit to the face because he was frustrated, but one is all he'll get tonight. Number four, Superman. One of the biggest movies of 2016. It's been teased since I Am Legend in the very background. Batman vs Superman, Son of Krypton vs Bat of Gotham. Who will come out on top? Hmm. While well, the general audience wasn't a big fan of this outcome, but Bruce Wayne, took this one. Bruce almost ended the god too, but luckily he was reminded of his mother and therefore his own mortality, so he didn't go through with that execution. In Batman vs Superman, I mean sure Bruce had kryptonite, but Superman easily could have punched him into vapor. I wasn't too happy with this win, but after accumulating over $870 million in the box office, we figured it was worth a Martha mention. In the comics too, Batman has come out on top. In Injustice Year 5, Batman beats Superman in a back alley, and of course in The Dark Knight Returns, Bruce gets pretty close to ending the son of Krypton. Number three, Azrael. Right after the 1993 Nightfall storyline when Batman got wrecked by Bane, his back was broken. He decided to pass the Batman mantle to not Dick Grayson, no, instead he chose Jean-Paul Valley, AKA Azrael. This guy is a crazy substitute. I mean, his run as Batman wasn't the same at all. Batman wasn't nearly as violent as Azrael. He's also just messy and irresponsible the way he handles things. Not really a great look for Gotham, but we have to admit he is a tad impressive because he did beat Bane with his, you know, advanced Autobot looking suit. So he did a good job on paper. He was a decent successor, but not a permanent one. Once Bruce recovered, he had to physically force Azbat to leave the position. He got too cozy in the crime fighting life, but you know what, I don't blame him. But yeah, as far as being Batman, even the style changes were drastic. He had claws. I don't know, I'm not a big fan of claws. If someone was saving my life from a crime and he had claws looking like that, I would think I'm in more trouble. Number two, Green Lantern. This one comes from Justice League issue five. Fans refer to it simply as the punch. At this time in comics, Batman was about to become the leader of the Justice League International, and Guy Gardner doesn't really share the same enthusiasm as the rest of the team. For more than one issue, he makes it very clear that he doesn't want Batman to run the show, although Batman was clearly a better fit for the role. Whatever, people get jealous. Guy was being sour, he was being a sour guy, so he challenged Batman to a fight without the use of his power ring. Just one human to another. Batman was already a human before, so it's gonna get messy. Batman easily knocked him down, and you guessed it, he did so with one punch. Yeah, of course, he's Batman, and without the ring, you're literally just a guy. Literally a guy. Blue Beetle started shouting one punch, one punch over and over again. He was hyped up, and readers were for sure doing the same. I know I was. And finally, number one, the Justice League. One of the more impressive defeats comes from the Tower of Babel storyline that began back in JLA issue 43. It's a four-parter written by Mark Wade, where Ra's al Ghul and the League of Assassins strike against every member of the Justice League using their personal lives and vulnerabilities. How does one get all this information? Well, it's all thanks to Batman and his trust issues. See, Bruce was keeping a hidden file that exposed all the strengths and weaknesses of the JLA. He made this file just in case any of them were to go rogue. So this man just gave away revenge recipes. Here you go, here's the password, enjoy. Batman figured all these out so he wrote them down. Okay, so red kryptonite to use on Superman, okay. Nanites to trap Wonder Woman in a virtual battle with herself. A post-hypnotic suggestion would make the Green Lantern will himself into blindness. He has a Vibra bullet as well that would send the Flash into light speed seizures. And a magnesium virus would cause Martian Manhunter's skin to burst into flames when he's exposed to air. Also, Scarecrow's fear toxin would make Aquaman afraid of water and Plastic Man, well, you just freeze him and Flick him. Some blame Ra's al Ghul, but I blame the guy who had a dirty file of secrets. I don't know. I don't trust rich orphans anymore. That's my thing. I'm for sure going through all my friends' phones now. In a 10, Cupid. First appearing in Green Arrow and Black Canary number 15 from 2009, Carrie Cutter, also known as Cupid, is a deranged Green Arrow attempted mimic, even if she isn't really that good with a bow in the comics, and former special ops soldier. Cupid first showed up in Star City at a scene of one of the Green Arrow's fights. She picked up the broken tip of one of his arrows and carved the infamous heart with an arrow through it onto her chest. She then began killing off some of his notable enemies in the hope that she may begin to fulfill his heart's desire. And she killed the guy who cut her hair because she never wanted someone else to have hair that perfect. 
Yeah. Cupid is in essence Oliver's Joker in a way, since there is no Cupid without Green Arrow, and let's be honest, they're both absolutely nuts. The character did appear in the show, however, was not nearly as crazy, and quickly turned her affection to Deadshot after joining the Suicide Squad. Cupid being obsessed with Arrow was kind of like a one to two episode thing in the show. And at nine, Onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia was introduced in Green Arrow number 12 from 2002 and was created by Kevin Smith and Phil Hester. Onomatopoeia first appears when he murders a female crime fighter named Virago after telling her his name. The interlude in which this occurs serves as a lead into the sounds of violence and is the main villain of a short storyline that runs from issues 13 to 15 of that Green Arrow run, which is called The Sounds of Violence. Just the sheer ridiculousness of this character is enough to earn him a spot on this list for me though. And the great thing is that this character only works in comic books unless you give him like superpowers. Saying bang in a cinematic setting only makes for an awkward moment after a real gunshot unless you saying bang actually makes a gunshot. Since in movies gunshots sound nothing like that and you can't really make that sound with your mouth. Onomatopoeia just talks in onomatopoeia which is spelling out sounds like bang or crack or snap. And this character is something I really find interesting for this reason. Plus, this man looks like he's a guard from Squid Game with like his mask thing. Look, I wonder where Squid Game got the idea and I think it was this guy. And today, Prometheus. Created by Grant Morrison and Arnie Jorgensen, the most recognized version of Prometheus made his first appearance in New Year's Evil Prometheus from 1998. Commonly an adversary of the Justice League, Prometheus would also serve as an enemy to Batman, Green Arrow, and Midnighter. Prometheus possesses no superhuman abilities, but has undergone intense physical and mental training and utilizes an extensive range of equipment and technology, just like Batman does. However, Prometheus is probably the most known in the Green Arrow community for being the start of the trial of Green Arrow storyline, commonly known as the worst Green Arrow storyline of all time, where Oliver kills Prometheus after he bombs Star City, kills Roy's daughter, and cuts off Roy's arm. And then Oliver gets put on trial for murder. The character also appeared in the Arrowverse as assistant district attorney Adrian Chase, which some assumed was going to be revealed as Vigilante, but Adrian Chase just turned out to be an alias used by Justin Claiborne's son after plotting revenge after the Arrow killed his father off in uh, like off screen in season one. Yeah. And it's seven, Parasite. The Raymond Maxwell Jensen version of the Parasite first appeared in Action Comics number 340 from 1966, and is basically like some weird form of mind melder that has the ability to temporarily absorb the life energy, superpowers, and knowledge of their victim. The character was actually created by Jim Shooter, who was 13 when he thought of the character. Following an encounter with the strange visitor, however, the Parasite's powers were enhanced and enabled him to retain the energy he takes for longer, as well as granting Jones, the next Parasite, the ability to shapeshift. He can now physically morph into his victims right down to their DNA, being able to access their memories, gain their natural abilities, and mimic their voice. Which I think you know is pretty damn dangerous. At least it only lasts for a certain length of time though. However, Parasite also absorbs the weaknesses of superpowered individuals, even if someone else he absorbs has an immunity to it. And at 6, Mr. Mixie's Pitalik. Mixie's Pitalik possesses reality warping powers with which he enjoys tormenting Superman, or just making life difficult because, you know, he's like like a little sibling. His portrayal has been varied, with him being an outright supervillain in some instances and an anti-hero in others. But in most of Mix's appearances in DC Comics, he can be stopped only by tricking him into saying or spelling his own name backwards, which sends him back to the fifth dimension that he calls home and keeps him there for at least 90 days. That's not even three months, bro. Come on. However, after Crisis on Infinite Earths, he was changed to having a new requirement that needed to be met for him to leave. That would change each story, such as Superman getting him to paint his own face blue. So, Mix getting Superman to make Mix paint his face blue. Like his own face. This is one of the few villains that actually uses Superman's other weakness, magic, against him, since most just resort to kryptonite. This guy has the ability to warp reality and do basically whatever he wants, and since he comes from the fifth dimension, he isn't bound by the laws of third dimensional beings, whatever that means. But like, Bro, what is with your name? Like, I get that it's supposed to be hard to say, so it's hard to say backwards, but like, come on. Cut a guy some slack. I talk about Five Nights at Freddy's all day. Okay, I don't have room in my brain for this. Halfway through, in at number five, Bizarro. Being first introduced in Superboy number 68 from 1958, Bizarro was actually a teen at first. However, an adult version of the character was introduced in the Superman newspaper comic strip, but he was wearing a B on his chest instead of an S. However, in 1959, we saw an adult version of the character introduced into the Superman comic books, this time wearing an S in Action Comics number 254. Despite his complicated history, though, 
Bizarro has all the powers of Superman except reversed. So instead of heat vision, he has freeze vision, flame breath, vacuum breath. Imagine a freaking Bizarro vacuum. That would be blessed. Why hasn't anyone branded vacuums like that yet? Like this is an untapped market. And yes, I do mean actual vacuums, you sickos. And his other abilities are also flipped, like being able to see through only lead. And Bizarro is strengthened by green kryptonite, which only makes things worse for normal soups. Am I right? While Bizarro never really seems to come out on top, does that mean that since everything for him is reversed that he's actually winning all the time? Because if that is the case, I don't know if he should be on this list, because in his mind technically he, he would be undefeated, right? And it for General Zod. General Zod was first introduced in Adventure Comics number 283 from 1961 and is also a Kryptonian like Superman, therefore has the same powers, which makes him a pretty powerful adversary. It's like the whole conundrum of if you fought yourself, who would win? Or would you just keep fighting until you both collapse from exhaustion? However, what he has over Kal-El is experience. Being the leader of the Kryptonian military, Zod is an expert tactician and is trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And while yes, they both pack a punch, knowing how to fight or predict your opponent's moves is also critical to winning. However, Zod's powers are often inferior to those of Superman, due to Superman being exposed to the yellow sun over the course of his entire life, while Zod typically only gets it for a short period of time before being returned to the Phantom Zone. This greater power combined with the superior control and experience with it gives Superman an edge over Zod's actual like fighting skills, so that, that, that he, he does end up losing more commonly than not, if ever. So, uh, sorry Zod. Getting close to the end, in at number 3, Damian Dark. Damian Dark was the big bad for season 4 of Arrow, and ultimately was one of the most powerful villains Oliver had ever faced in the show, or even still has ever faced. Using a totem found on Lian Yu, because of course it was, everyone who dies around Damian can be absorbed as some form of mystical power that grants him plenty of different powers, much like those granted to Jedi through use of the Force. I'm not even kidding. Damian can stop people in their tracks, choke them, drain the light from them just by touching them, he has super strength, he can catch arrows midair with magic. Not to mention the team up in Legends of Tomorrow with Malcolm Merlin and Eobard Thawne. Damien did ultimately eat the dust though at the end of season 4, when Oliver with the positive vibes of an entire city behind him ends up being able to overpower Dark's magic even after an entire city of deaths was powering him. Haven Rock's destruction was one of the turning points of the series, with tens of thousands of people getting killed in the explosion. Damien at this point was literally able to disintegrate arrows and bullets without even trying. Oliver shoots arrows at him and they just like turn into smoke in front of him and Damien's like, oh, I didn't even mean to do that. Penultimately, in at number two, Deathstroke. Being introduced in the new Teen Titans number 2 in 1980 as Deathstroke the Terminator, Deathstroke is often seen as the arch enemy to the Teen Titans. However, the character has also served as a villain for Batman, Green Arrow, and the Justice League, and is the main antagonist of Arrow Season 2. The show seems to be a more powerful version though when talking about brute strength, since his blood at this point contains Mirakuru, a basically super soldier serum that was ironically again found on Lian Yu and used to save Slade's life. After the Mirakuru is in his bloodstream though, he develops serious anger issues and this is actually tied to his strength. The character returns in season 2 to extract revenge on Oliver by killing the ones he loves, but was ultimately defeated after Felicity injects him with the Mirakuru cure. The character then regains possession of all his marbles and helps Oliver in the season 5 finale, as well as having his own arc to find his son in season 6. Oliver helps Slade do this though, even though Slade killed Oliver's mother in the season 2 episode Seeing Red, but using a deleted scene from season 2, Oliver saves his mother in the post-crisis timeline that he created which is honestly something that I can respect. If you're recreating the universe, or the multiverse even, you might as well resurrect your dead friends and family, if you can. Finally, in at number one, The Anti-Monitor. This is a show exclusive as far as I'm aware, since this played out totally differently in the comics. However, in the Arrowverse Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover event, Oliver dies while trying to save as many people from Earth 38 as possible, resulting in over 3 billion lives being saved while he held off the Shadow Demons. Later on though, Oliver, instead of being resurrected by the Lazarus Pit and having his soul restored to his body, ends up becoming the Spectre, a pseudo-god in the DC Universe, and the catalyst to restoring the multiverse in this crossover. 
This also comes with a wicked set of powers, but nonetheless in a one on one fight Oliver both held his own and beat the anti monitor head to head which is freaking nuts. This man had literally wiped out the multiverse and yet here we are with a new set of earths because Oliver with the help of the paragons willed it so. The battle was wicked, the death was heartbreaking, yet either way Oliver managed to defeat what was in essence a god, a, the god of the antimatter universe certainly, and gain some sweet powers to boot. Atta boy Oliver, you're who I pray to now. In a 10 chameleon. Being the first villain Spider-Man ever faced way back in Amazing Spider-Man number 1 in 1963, I think Chameleon is more underrated than he should be. Being able to look like anyone at any time is pretty damn overpowered. Especially when you can use it to look like Spider-Man and use suction cups to stick to walls, even if that's uh, slightly unrealistic. This character is especially powerful when he has superpowers, like in the 90s animated Spider-Man series, where he could simply look at you and end up transforming into you. That's actually insanely overpowered when you look at it like that. Since he he can also transform his clothes in that show. He could be fleeing from Spider-Man and then turn the corner and be anyone, so it's certainly someone to fear, unless they're the original version who has to use disguises and makeup to look like anyone they want, since that process takes time and it can't really be turned on or off at will. In a 9, Mysterio. First appearing in The Amazing Spider-Man number 13 from 1964, Quentin Beck does not possess any superhuman abilities. He is a formal special effects artist, illusionist, and actor who uses his talents to commit crimes. He is a founding member of the Sinister Six as well, which is an impressive feat on its own considering how he has no powers. In the first battle with Spider-Man after he frames Spider-Man for robbing the Midtown Museum, Mysterio obstructs the hero's spider sense with gas and, and dissolves his webbing with chemical abrasive. However, Spider-Man tricks Mysterio into revealing that he was the actual one who robbed the museum, then Spider-Man revealed that he had captured that moment on tape. Mysterio was then sent to jail, blaming Spider-Man for his ruined career. However, the abilities of Mysterio are actually really impressive. With a lot of his powers seemingly only being able to be accomplished with CGI in post production rather than with practical effects, which is what he was using. And I was actually going to be a special effects artist. I even started going to school for it, so trust me, it, his stuff is absolutely insane. And it ain't Venom. The symbiote that later became known as Venom was created by the dark elder god Null on a desolate nameless planet, where it saved a group of newborn baby rodentoid aliens by bonding to them and transforming them into apex predators. The symbiote's first human host though was Deadpool, who came across its prison while on Battleworld and, hoping for a makeover, wore the creature for a few minutes before realizing it was alive and trying to take over his mind. Concerned that his insanity would adversely affect it, Deadpool returned the symbiote to its prison moments before the arrival of Spider-Man. Spider-Man, whose own suit had been damaged in the battle that was going on outside that Deadpool just seemingly was ignoring. Spider-Man had found the prison module that the symbiote was trapped in and activated the machine, which released the symbiote in the form of a black sphere. When Spider-Man touched the sphere, it covered his body and transformed into the iconic black and white costume with large white spider emblems on the chest and back derived from Null's dragon emblem actually. Venom, even though the concept was bought from a fan for what would now be worth $550, became one of if not the most iconic Spider-Man villain, and with the ability to block out the spider sense, it's a surprise Peter even managed to come out on top. And it's 7, Count Vertigo. Count Vertigo is the last descendant of the royal family that ruled over the small eastern European country of Latvia that was taken over by the Soviets and later became devastated by the Spectre. First introduced in World's Finest Comics number 251 from 1978, the original comic book version is much more interesting than his modernized TV show counterpart. Also, basically all of these characters have appeared on the show just because they're also some of the Green Arrow's most iconic villains, so I will be making comparisons. Count Vertigo first appeared in Star City where he attempted to steal back the jewels his parents had to sell when they had escaped to England after the war. The victim of a hereditary inner ear defect that affects his balance, Vertigo has a small electronic device implanted into his right temple that compensated for this problem. Tinkering with the device, Vertigo learned that he was able to affect other people's balance as well, distorting their perceptions of what they would see and basically they couldn't tell up from down, which he calls Vertigo even though Vertigo is just the sensation of a room spinning when it's not, instead of like not knowing where you're going, whatever. But still, this is how he works in the comics, whereas on the TV show, show he was a dealer who made a substance known as vertigo that nearly gets Thea killed in a car accident because she was being dumb. Yet even though he's killed off in season 2, vertigo as a substance remains present throughout the rest of the show. I think it made its like final appearance in like season 6 though, but I'm not sure. And at 6, Constantine Draken. 
First appearing in Green Arrow Volume 3, number 27 in 2003, Constantine Draken is a short guy, much like myself prior to grade 11. As a child, he was teased for this by other children, but once he started killing people at the age of 10, he found that he was no longer sensitive about his stature, which I guess is understandable, cause like why would you care if you're being made fun of if you could just kill them, right? I mean, it, it solves the problem. But when troll-like monsters began to terrorize the Elvast Corporation's construction sites, the company hired Draken to take care of it. However, he ran into the Green Arrow who was also investigating the monsters. Draken was able to defeat Oliver, however he didn't kill him because he wasn't getting paid enough yet. He then seemed to act as if he was on retainer for Elvast, killing Black Lightning's niece because she discovered information that proved the troll monsters were actually created by Elvast through an imperfect vaccine side effect. Oh god, I can hear the comments now. In the TV show, Draken was Adam Hunt's head of security and later on an assassin version of the character popped up played by a different actor. That was in season 3 and they thought that he had killed Sarah Lance, but I don't I don't know if they intended for that to be the same character. On the wikis they're like kind of interchangeable. It depends on who you ask. Halfway through into number 5, Brick. Brick is certainly an interesting guy. Daniel Brickwell was originally a low-level henchman or enforcer for various mobsters in Star City and also ran his own street gang. However, he had a brilliant criminal mind and higher aspirations to go with it. We love a dreamer. In the wake of a demonic attack against Star City, he began to expand his gang's criminal activities, particularly illicit substances sales, and push them into areas left vacant by other criminal organizations. However, this guy also has a power, first being introduced in Green Arrow Volume 3 Number 40 from 2004, Brick is literally made of brick. In essence, the DC version of the thing, but a bad guy. Which is a stark counter to his Arrowverse counterpart, who was just a mob boss introduced in Season 3. Even though metahumans were introduced into the Arrowverse that season as well, because Flash Season 1 had started at that point, they could have just put him in Star City and made him a brick, but oh well. In the comics though, Green Arrow challenged Brick to a duel over who owns Star City. He shot a glue arrow into the back of Brick's mouth, blocking his throat and suffocating him, but rather than allowing him to die, Green Arrow saved him, warning him that if he steps too far out of line again, next time he's gonna die. But since this incident, his interference with law enforcement and the political figures of Star City had either ceased or vastly subsided, which I have to say is a pretty sexy power move from Oliver. In it for Merlin. Long before becoming the vigilante Green Arrow, Oliver Queen was inspired to take up archery after hearing of the exploits of Arthur King, otherwise known as Merlin the Magician, a master archer with acute accuracy. Years later, Merlin challenged the Green Arrow to a public archery duel and defeated Oliver. With that victory under his belt, Merlin vanished for years before resurfacing as a member of the League of Assassins. He and Green Arrow faced off against each other again when Merlin attempted to assassinate Batman, but Green Arrow managed to intercept Merlin's arrow with one of his own, saving Batman's life. Merlin admitted that Green Arrow had improved since their last encounter, but he escaped before he could be captured. In the show, the Dark Archer is played by John Barrowman and is named Malcolm Merlin, CEO of Merlin Global Group and father to Tommy Merlin and, spoiler alert for season 2, Thea Queen. He is a recurring character in the first five seasons and is a villain in most of his appearances, with the exception of a couple times throughout when it served as better interests. Spoiler alert yet again for season 5 because I feel obligated to because it's my favorite show. He ultimately dies in Lian Yu after Thea activates a landmine and he takes her place on it. They were lured there by Adrian Chase aka Prometheus so that Oliver could save his son, but yeah. If you haven't seen Arrow, go watch it, please. Getting close to the end, in at number 3, Atrocity. Introduced and only seen in the Spider-Man game Spider-Man Edge of Time from 2011, Atrocity was created after Anti-Venom went into a blind rage, accidentally knocking Otto Octavius and Walker Sloan into Walker Sloan's gateway. Time traveling gateway, by the way. The three then fused in the space-time continuum. I tried getting Taylor to put this on a list for ages, so here I am putting it here because holy damn this is a villain. Atrocity would occasionally attack Parker or O'Hara with its teleportation tentacles throughout their journey in the Alchemax building, until it eventually revealed itself and attacked Peter Parker. Atrocity was defeated but would later appear again, attempting to kill Peter Parker at the same time that the CEO of Alchemax was fighting Miguel O'Hara. We as Parker manipulated Atrocity into attacking electrified pillars, stunning it. Peter then took this opportunity to remove Atrocity's tentacles and send them through the time gateway. These tentacles were then used to drain the Alchemax CEO of his powers. After both Atrocity and the Alchemax CEO, who is revealed to be Peter Parker, were vulnerable, they were knocked into the gateway together simultaneously, resetting the timeline. This absolute monstrosity is also able to teleport himself through time and space in the addition to all of his powers. So yeah, 
An atrocity for sure. Penultimately, in at number two, Red Goblin. After the collapse of S.H.I.E.L.D., the Carnage symbiote was secured in the lockbox, a privately run vault at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Agents Crane and Coleman, though, infiltrated the lockbox and stole the symbiote, delivering it to their employer, Norman Osborn. After receiving the symbiote, Osborn bonded with it to become the new Carnage, hoping that it would be the key to regaining his Green Goblin persona. While the symbiote initially seized control of him, Norman offered to teach it more nuanced and sadistic ways to kill people people, an offer that the symbiote eagerly accepted, turning over control to its new host. Restoring his appearance and purging his body of the nanites, preventing him from augmenting himself with the goblin formula. Osborn then used the symbiote to kill Phil Urich, and after pretending to be mortally wounded in a rematch against Spider-Man as the Green Goblin, unveiled his new partner by transforming into the monstrous Red Goblin. Osborn used the symbiote to great effect, incapacitating Spider-Man's allies and loved ones, and bonding a portion of it to his grandson Normie Osborn to turn him into the Goblin Child. Spidey was only able to defeat Red Goblin by taunting Osborn, saying that killing him in that form would only give Carnage the credit and not him, which caused him to rip off the symbiote. Then Spider-Man was able to destroy it. Finally, and at number one, Graviton. If you're not familiar with Graviton, just know that he's essentially Magneto, but with gravity instead of metal, which is already making you think, oh shit. And that's exactly right. During the Axe of Vengeance crossover storyline, Graviton essentially crushed Spider-Man in their first encounter. Only for Spider-Man to come back and absolutely wipe the floor with him when he got the Captain Universe powers. But that may seem a little cheap when talking about a list of Spider-Man villains. So, how about when Graviton was a part of a group of villains that sought revenge on Spider-Man following the loss of his cosmic powers? Spider-Man was still able to defeat Graviton without the power cosmic. During the fight though, Graviton actually disabled Spider-Man's gravity sending the web slinger floating up into the sky. But Spider-Man was able to web onto a passing plane before he actually like got too high. And then when Spidey got back to the ground and to the fight, he took an unprotected by gravity Graviton out with one single punch. So needless to say, Spider-Man has some pretty sick licks to lay out. In a 10, Lex Luthor. While you can't really have a list of Superman villains without Lex, the character isn't all that powerful when you look at it. Like sure, he's popular among fans and runs a business, so he has some pull in society and whatnot, but in reality, he's just the dude with mommy issues that is just jealous of Superman. Man. Sure, at some points he may wear and pilot a mech suit that gives him advanced weaponry and whatnot, but otherwise he's just a guy who pays other guys to fight for him. Which I mean, like, in, in a sense, money is power, but like when compared to other people on this list, and even compared to Superman, Lex doesn't really have much going for him, aside from maybe a little bit of kryptonite. But Lex is constantly losing to soups as well, which only makes him angrier, and this, that's just funny as hell to me. Uh, we love it when a jerk gets mad because he didn't get what he wants. Lex is kind of like a brat. You know, like the, the kind of brat that will team up with their parents to take out the town's crazy dude if they need to. Like, you know what I mean? Like, any kid's movie basically has one of these characters. Spiderwick Chronicles, okay? The big sister is pretty much like this. She's like that until she gets her leg bit by a goblin and realizes that her brothers ain't crazy. That's that's Lex. And at nine, Steppenwolf. Because everyone prefers the theatrical version of Justice League, right? Steppenwolf was introduced in New Gods number no. 7 from 1972 and is a new god and military general from the planet Apocalypse. Stephen Wolf is the brother of Hegra and therefore the maternal uncle of Darkseid, which is like a really weird family dynamic given that he is commonly depicted as Darkseid's subordinate. Commanding his nephew's army of parademons in conflict against Superman and the Justice League. In the theatrical version of the Justice League movie, Stephen Wolf is actually the main villain instead of Darkseid. However, you shouldn't discount the dark side of the moon's uncle because Stephen Wolf is immortal and has vast superhuman strength, speed, and endurance capable of lifting up to 10,000 tons and jumping huge distances easily. He has superhuman reflexes and a high degree of invulnerability, which increases with his battle armor and allows him to resist most physical and energetic attacks. So while yes, they did manage to defeat him, it was still quite the battle. In it ate Metallo. John Corbin is usually featured as either a willing volunteer for a surgery or a mortally wounded test subject that needs the surgery to save his life. Metallo first appeared in the Superman comic strip storyline, The Menace of Metallo, which ran from the 15th of December 1958 to the 4th of April 1959. This procedure, whether willing or not, ends up turning John into a cyborg powered by a kryptonite heart, which I think you know what that means. While usually 
usually working as another supervillain's lackey, Metello has the strength to go head to head with the Man of Steel, especially given that he has the strength of Superman and then weakens him when with his heart when he's nearby. Metallo's robot body offers him a high degree of protection from physical and energy attacks as well. Among his enhanced abilities, he also no longer needs to eat, sleep, or breathe. And isn't that the dream? His brain is also sealed away inside a shielded alloy skull that has its own power supply. So trust me, I know. Sentient robots that want to kill are definitely not something to be trifled with. At least the timeline for Metallo isn't all that complicated. And it's 7 Spider Carnage. Spider Carnage is my favorite alternate version of Spider-Man. From what I could find being introduced in the Spider-Man animated series in the 1990s, this version of Peter Parker shared most of his life with his actually good counterpart. However, the difference between the two was that at some point, Aunt May also died, being buried next to Uncle Ben. But thanks to some messing around with interdimensional portals, a version of the Carnage symbiote sensed Peter's anger and combined with him, turning him into Spider Carnage, a villain set on revenge and the destruction of all realities. Peter Parker with the Carnage symbiote and then a desire to destroy reality, oh my god. However, he was ultimately defeated when the main series Peter brought the Uncle Ben from another universe to talk to Spider Carnage and actually brought him down and made him sacrifice himself to save all reality. Damn, I love this show, I really do. If you haven't seen it, it's on Disney Plus. Please watch it if you can, it's so good. And it's six, Morlun. First appearing in Amazing Spider-Man Volume 2 Number 30 in 2001, Morlun is one of the most influential Spider-Man villains of all time. Morlun is potentially the biggest threat Spider-Man has ever faced, even if he isn't the most powerful, since defeating him ended up requiring a whole multiverse of spider people, or as the comics were calling them, spider totems, to take him down. Coming from Earth 1, Morlun uses these spider totems to stay alive, feeding on their energy and casually just hopping around from universe to universe, squashing their spider person. This guy is the backbone of the Spider-Verse concept, and a load of spider totems had to team up in order to actually beat him, but not without massive casualties. So definitely a powerful villain that ended up losing overall, but maybe I guess he didn't lose since he did kill off multiple spider people before his actual defeat. Well I mean I guess it depends on how he looks at defeat and what his definition of the term is, since some people could consider killing one person a success, so who knows? Halfway through in at number 5, Venom 2099. Venom 2099 is actually Kron Stone, the son of Tyler Stone and as revealed later on the older half-brother of Miguel O'Hara who is the Spider-Man of 2099. Talk about family issues. Kron became violent and brutal after suffering for years because of his abusive robot maid. Yeah, this is certainly an interesting origin. Either way, this all drove him into killing Punisher 2099's family. This was also before gaining any superpowers, since the encounter with Jake Gallows, who is Punisher 2099, nearly gets him killed. So Kron flees into the sewer, narrowly escaping with his life. And you know, since he was absolutely destroyed and hardly clinging to life, he ended up floating down the sewer, eventually running into this strange black ball. This black ball was actually the mutated form of the Venom symbiote that had somehow survived without a host all this time. The symbiote, who was also on the brink of death, bonded to Kron and they became Venom 2099. This new version of the Venom symbiote also had acidic saliva and blood. So that does make him more dangerous than the original Venom. But Miguel was still able to come out on top. Atta boy, Miguel. Spider-Man 2099's costume is so sick, man. And it for Carnage. When the Venom symbiote came to rescue its host, Eddie Brock, from jail, it left an asexually produced offspring behind. This spawn bonded to Cletus Cassidy, a renowned serial killer in the Marvel Universe, through a wound on his hand, merging with his blood and becoming red and black in color. Now going by the name of Carnage, Cletus became a deadly recurring enemy to both Spider-Man and Venom. Eventually, Carnage fought Spider-Man and actually beat him. Realizing that Carnage was another symbiote villain, Spider-Man enlisted the aid of Venom, who was actually retired at the time, to defeat him. After enlisting Venom's aid against Carnage, Spider-Man later used loud noises in an attempt to defeat both Cletus and Venom, which is a stone cold move. However, thanks to Cletus's psychopathic tendencies and the fact that he was created on Earth, he has a lot more abilities than his father, like shooting itself as a projectile and forming razor sharp weapons to tear through both innocents and his enemies with chef like precision, may I add. Getting close to the end in at number three, Brainiac. First introduced in Action Comics number 242 from 1958, Brainiac is one of Superman's greatest villains and has a personal connection with the hero. Since he shrunk and stole the capital 
capital city of Krypton, known as Kandor, and in some continuities is even responsible for Krypton's destruction. Brainiac's most consistent power is his 12th level intellect, allowing calculation abilities, enhanced memory, and advanced understanding of mechanical engineering, bioengineering, physics, and other theoretical and applied sciences, as well as extensive knowledge of various alien tech, because of course he does. And while that sounds confusing, we as a 21st century society are considered to have a 9th level intellect. Or as his post crisis version explains, he can process the sort of knowledge over 490 octodectillion beings could, which is absolutely monstrous. Okay, just so you can see it, that's about 490 with another 59 zeros after it, people worth of human brain power that he uses on a regular basis. So, yeah, he's definitely a smart cookie, but not the one that they use in Squid Game. Is that still a popular thing? Penultimately, in at number two, Dark Side. Darkseid was first introduced in Forever People number 1 and is the tyrannical ruler of Apocalypse and leader of the New Gods. As a New God, however, Darkseid is among the most powerful beings in the DC Universe. His most well known and utilized ability derives from the Omega Effect, which allows him to blast Omega Beams from his eyes. Omega Beams are an intense form of basically heated energy that can either act as a concussive force to subdue an opponent or as a disintegrating agent capable of eradicating organisms or objects from existence. Awesome. Some superpowered beings, such as Superman, have proven resistant to the beams, although Superman does it with a great deal of pain. The Omega Beams can also resurrect fallen beings that have previously been killed by them, and Darkseid will use this sometimes if he wants to punish people who fail him, but they're too valuable to kill at the moment. Darkseid also has pinpoint control over this energy, and his unwavering aim allows him to just control the memes to go wherever he goes. They can travel in straight lines, they can bend, they can curve around corners, even pass through matter and other forms of energy, which just makes these already horrifying things absolutely terrifying. And finally, in at number one, Doomsday. First appearing in Superman Man of Steel number 17 in 1992, Doomsday was invented to be a beast that would kill Superman. Since writers were growing concerned about how other villains relied too much on their tech or brain power to try to beat Superman. This was probably also to show that yes, even Superman can die. To give other heroes, I guess, something to fear. Or I guess the readers something to fear. Doomsday is depicted as a monstrous, genetically engineered being from the depths of prehistoric Krypton. His creator imbued him with a few feelings, mostly hate and the desire for destruction, which, let's face it, same. But this led to him destroying worlds and eventually finding Earth, where he met Superman. Doomsday is the one who killed Superman in Kelly's favorite The Death of Superman storyline, and the big thing with Doomsday is his ability to evolve. Doomsday gradually becomes more invulnerable if not injured beyond his ability to recover. Superman once used a sound gun to greatly discomfort him, but Doomsday's auditory canals closed up, making him impervious to the weapon next time. So basically anything that hurts or kills him basically won't do that a second time, which is absolutely absurd and definitely makes him one of Superman's greatest foes. And you know, he's the only one who killed him. So yeah, that's a number one. Coming in at number 10, we've got The Thing. The beefiest, brawniest, burliest, surliest member of the Fantastic Four doesn't often lose in a battle of might. Wits could be another thing, and when it comes to speed and timing, things could end poorly too. But on most days, there isn't going to be anyone stronger than Benjamin Grimm. After being hit with some wild cosmic rays, his body underwent some crazy changes. His skin became rough and rock-like, taking on an orangey hue and becoming near impenetrable. His toughness and density are through the roof, making him very hard to hurt. Along with his inbuilt armor, he also has a whole lot of additional wicked physical traits. Based on strength alone, he's one of the most powerful characters going. In fact, most consider him a consistent and classic rival to the Hulk. Incredible stamina, durability, and sensory adaptation round out his legendary bulk, and he technically is immortal if he chose not to revert to his human form every year. He doesn't age, can't really get hurt, and packs quite a wallop. In fact, after standing toe to toe with the mighty green mutant many times, the thing has indeed definitively won against the Hulk before. So how does he manage to lose a fight? Well, you can't win them all. When the Hulk heads to New York to get revenge on the Avengers, the Fantastic Four is waiting for him. Ben Grimm hops out in front and takes on the Hulk, and the battle is pretty evenly matched. However, at the end of the massively destructive fight, the Hulk reigns supreme. The thing collapses, totally wiped, and the Hulk is able to move right along. Dang, and we thought that incredible stamina would go on forever. Maybe next time, right? Coming in at number 9, we've got Mark Grayson. Ah, this one's a bit of a bummer, don't you think? A burgeoning young hero getting his ass beat by his own father. The father that seemed to promise to protect the Earth from any threat? Ah, such is the life of a Viltrumite. 
Mark Grayson aka Invincible was just getting a handle on his powers. He'd realized how strong he truly could be, but his dad Omni-Man was definitely stronger. But that's not too big a deal, right? Papa Nolan is going to stick around and defend the earth too, yeah? Teach Mark the ways of being a hero, maybe hit some sweet dance moves to a song called Hot Milk. Wrong. Omni-Man is actually evil and looking to conquer as many planets as possible. Damn, dude. When Mark attempts to stop him after he kills a plethora of supers, Omni-Man lays an absolute beatdown on his son. It is super, super brutal. My goodness. Coming in number eight, we've got Jon Stewart. One of Earth's Green Lanterns, Jon Stewart is blessed with all the powers one would expect. As leader of the Green Lantern Corps and a member of its honor guard, he's quite the formidable fighter. Renowned for his sharpshooting and building skills, not many can hold a candle to this hero. However, he isn't perfect, and all of the powers in the world won't help you if you get too cocky. Ah, uh, the classic tale of human hubris. Nobody's immune to it, no way. While working with Martian Manhunter to contain the anti-life equation, they realized they'd need to save the planet of Zanshi. The folks there were slowly being poisoned, and to make matters worse, the planet was laden with bombs that were set to blow. John, thinking that he was super powerful and unstoppable, decided to fly an injured Martian Manhunter to safety before heading down solo. Guess what though? The bombs were yellow. You know, the one color that renders a Green Lantern useless. So all he could do was get the hell out of Dodge, leaving Zanshi to an explosive doom. Damn. Number seven, Spider-Man. Coming in hot <laughs> from the Amazing Spider-Man 700.3, The Black Lodge Part One. We open in Queens, New York. It's past two in the morning. Peter is regretting having seconds at Aunt May's. He's just trying to go home, but now he's gotta go face to face with Firebrand. Peter even realizes that already this fight has gone on for too long. Usually this would be a piece of cake, but Peter ate too much cake. He was actually too full. He was tired. Now this is tedious. And then when Firebrand gets a hold of Peter's neck, it really, really starts to hurt. Firebrand unloads everything that he has, and then he sees Peter's suit start to melt and then rip apart. It's actually really brutal and pretty gory. By the time help arrives, he's unrecognizable. The cleanup crew literally thinks he's another super villain. They're like, eh, get him out of here, this burnt crispy man. Firebrand 2.0, whoever you are, bye. Peter received third degree burns on 80% of his body. <sighs> Aunt May, where's the aloe? We need some aloe stat. Number six, the Hulk. Mark Miller's Old Man Logan begins in Volume 3 of Wolverine at issue 66, and this is now a future where supervillains have won. <sighs> Sads. Hulk and She-Hulk had kids. Weird. The Hulklings, who would beat the crap out of you if you didn't pay rent, because basically everybody had their own territory, so Logan had to pay up. Hawkeye, who was also much older and now also blind, needed Logan's assistance to get across the country and deliver a secret package. This was a way Logan could make some of that rent money, so perfect, let's do it. Now when they get back from their trip, things have progressed in an awful, awful way. Hulk gang took out Logan's entire family because... Well, they were bored, of course. They're a little messed up in the head if you didn't already piece that together. So Logan dishes out some payback. No more games, no more talking. Logan's here to now get this done. Logan gets Banner right through the old chest plate, but we all know what happens next. He freaks out, he hooks out rather, and then he eats Logan. If you can't beat him, eat him, I guess. Now you'd think this would for sure be the end of it, but that's when Logan pops out from inside Banner. After what's gonna happen to Wolverine near the end of this list, it's nice to see him come out on top, or just come out of a body in general, that's fun. Number five, Jason Todd. Of course this is gonna be on the list. A Death in the Family is a four part storyline written by Jim Starlin and published in 1988. It contains perhaps one of the biggest, darkest moments in DC Comics history because we see the Joker beat the second Robin, Jason Todd. And when I say beat him, I mean he beat him with a crowbar and then used an explosive for good measure. He was a goner, for sure. And also, it was your parents' fault. Pause this video, go yell at them, come back, like it, click play. Yeah, DC left it up to readers how this story ends for Robin. Nowadays, fans are coming together on Twitter to see director cuts of movies that haven't even been released yet. So it's a little better now. We have a bit more of a squad. The actual beatdown, of course, is awful, but emotionally, the Joker destroys the boy Wonder as well. He used Jason Todd's birth mother. He blackmailed her in order to get closer to Jason, and it worked. Betrayed by his birth mother, and then the Joker, too, killed her. Double whammy, triple whammy. 
four whammies. I don't know, all the whammies. Number four, Green Arrow. Green Lantern, Green Arrow, issue 85. Let's talk about it. The first few pages, we see Oliver Queen walking at night trying to get home when all of a sudden some punks, some fools try and rob him. Now, this is a day in the park for most of our superheroes. Now, it's not like he was tired or maybe he didn't see it coming. Like Peter, he ate too much cake. He actually was in a bad mood. He had lady troubles. He was ready to fight. He was like, okay, I'm looking for this. You guys picked the wrong guy. Let's go. He's like getting warmed up. He was feeling good. And then a guy pulled out a crossbow because, you know, all those thugs that carry crossbows through the city. And then Ollie gets shot right through the shoulder with an arrow. Irony at its finest. Coming in number three, we've got Jean Grey. Ah, to be immensely powerful. Too bad the world isn't fair and something can always go wrong. Take Jean Grey, for example. Telekinetic and telepathic powers beyond compare, a connection with the powerful cosmic entity, the Phoenix, a bunch of awesome mutant pals. What could be better? Well, not experiencing a terrifying magnetic aneurysm, I guess. Yeah, that did not turn out too well for poor Jean Grey. After discovering that their new member Zorn was actually Magneto in disguise, the X-Men jumped into action. This did not prevent Magneto from releasing an insane wave of magnetic energy absolutely wrecking Jean's brain though. Unfortunately, there was nothing she could do about it and she perished almost instantly. Yikes. Coming in number two, we've got Captain America. Ah, now the tables have turned a little. We talked about Iron Man having a tough time stacking up against his longtime pals a little earlier. Now is his time to shine. In Civil War, we see Captain America and Iron Man get into a bit of a kerfuffle. And by bit of a kerfuffle, I do mean brutal brawl with all sorts of stuff on the line. It's a crazy fight with plenty of killer moments and momentum swings, but in the end, Tony Stark comes out on top. Damn, Cap. And finally, at number one, we've got Silver Surfer. Not the power cosmic. That's absolutely wild. This Herald of Galactus is one of the most powerful ones going and has strength beyond compare. He can harness immense energy from the universe and channel it in different ways. On most days, barring insane divine intervention or other heroes becoming ludicrously overpowered, he's unstoppable, a force to be reckoned with. However, there have been entities that fought with Silver Surfer and came out on top. Doesn't happen often, but it isn't totally impossible. There's the wild bit from Marvel Zombies that sees this cosmic power get taken down. And there are even a few non-zombie runs where he's taken down a peg. Adam Warlock knocked him out to prevent Silver Surfer from joining a fight against Thanos. Oh, and at some point, Deadpool gained the powers granted to Heralds of Galactus 2, which was very interesting. Made for a good fight, that's for sure. Coming in at number 10, we have Quicksilver, the speedster that both Fox and Disney were throwing into the movies, which had a lot of comic fans confused. Like, how many nerds out there had to explain to their friends why the same character was in two movies, but played by different people, but they weren't in the same universe? Thankfully, the MCU is now all connected and we don't need to have that conversation again. As long as Sony doesn't try to rip Spider-Man away from us. I couldn't handle that another time. For fans of the X-Men comics, you will be well aware of the House of M storyline. This was one of the most monumental events that has ever happened in the Marvel Universe, and it changed the mutant race forever. Scarlet Witch was going through an immense amount of emotional stress, and she was at her breaking point and decided that she would use her reality-altering powers to reshape the world forever. She called out, no more humans. And the population of superpowered beings that was in the range of 1.2 million was now pulled down to less than 200. Over a million mutants were stripped of their powers and Quicksilver was along with them. I wonder how it felt experiencing the crushing boredom of traffic for the first time ever in your life. Coming in at number eight, we have Miss Marvel, one of the most super powerful characters in the Marvel Universe. Following a similar space cop motif that Green Lantern uses, it would seem that very few people would be able to stand up to her. I mean, we all remember in Avengers Endgame when she took a headbutt from Thanos without even flinching, but that doesn't mean that she's impervious to any sort of harm, especially when we're talking about harm coming from Rogue. Miss Marvel and Rogue got into a one-on-one -on -one conflict that would change the two characters forever. In this clash, Rogue comes in contact with Miss Marvel and uses her vampiric power draining abilities, but she wasn't nice about it. Rogue drained Miss Marvel until she sucked out every last ounce of super powered energy that was inside of her, making Rogue insanely strong and leaving Miss Marvel not that marvelous. 
Coming in number 7 we've got Nightcrawler. Most folks like living life without a gaping hole in their chest, but most folks also can't teleport around in the blink of an eye. It's a tough world for a teleporting superhero, especially one with a drive to help as many people as possible. Nightcrawler, being a genuine hero, puts his life on the line and pays the price. In a future where there are no more mutants thanks to a lovely spell cast by Scarlet Witch, only one hope remains. Incidentally, this hope comes in the form of a mutant girl named Hope. Subtle. When Bastion, a super advanced sentinel from the future, comes back to kill Hope, Nightcrawler gets in his way. Unfortunately, in the way also means that the sentinel's arm is right through Nightcrawler's chest. Oops. In a last ditch effort to keep Hope alive, Nightcrawler uses all of his strength to teleport her away from the murderous machine. Once he completes that task, he runs out of fuel and dies. Coming in number 6 we've got Eric O'Grady and this one is painful. Eric O'Grady, one of the least lovable Ant-Men, lived his life like a bit of a loser. However, he was still indeed Ant-Man with all of the powers that came along with the title. Plenty of potential there, that's for sure. And even though he was no saint in life, he was definitely a hero in death. Somehow a child fell into the clutches of the Descendants, a group of artificially intelligent super cyborgs. They may look human and act human, but they definitely aren't. And this is proven when they delve deep into the depths of cruelty and stomp poor Eric to death. He saved the kid, but was unable to come away with his own life. Ouch. After being reduced to a bloody pulp, the cyborgs also took his likeness and created a new Ant-Man, one that would infiltrate his old team and betray them at a critical junction. Coming in number 5 we've got Shazam. What? Shazam? The closest thing to Superman we've got without getting Superman. Who's gonna beat him in a fight? I suppose you can't necessarily count on him to be at 100% mental fortitude though, considering that underneath all of that ancient magic and musculature, there is a 15 year old with a strong heart. There's a lot that goes on in a teenager's brain that might cause him to make some bad decisions, you know? Like in the case of Shazam vs Harley Quinn for example. Quinn tosses a hammer at Shazam who seems to think it's gonna be an easy fight. He has the strength and reflexes to deal with that hammer no problem. And here's the thing, he keeps talking to Quinn after he catches the hammer and doesn't really do anything with the wayward weapon. So what happens next? The hammer explodes. Oh boy. Shazam, you could have won the fight, but you didn't. Coming at number 4 we've got Iron Man. Oh Tony, if only you were better at getting along with people. All throughout Iron Man's history, Tony Stark has been a bit insufferable. Although he's a super genius with a heart of, well, maybe not gold, but something like it, he tends to rub people the wrong way. So even if he manages to defeat plenty of supervillains and keep the world safe, he's still got some other stuff to contend with. From time to time, he'll do something that really makes another hero mad. And that hero might decide to fight Iron Man. And in a lot of these cases, Iron Man doesn't fare all that well. Like, he's lost to pretty much every mainline Avenger at some point, from Spider-Man to the Hulk to Thor to even Black Widow. It's tough when you paint such a big target on your back, but I'm sure he understands. Right after that we have Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange lost his powers in one of the coolest, dumbest ways possible. Earth was under attack from the Imperi Cool, which are a futuristic robot race from another dimension. They hate magic and travel through time and space to destroy it in every form. The Imperi Cool came to Earth to battle Doctor Strange, and Strange summoned up all the magic on Earth into his body in an attempt to destroy the Imperi Cool leader, but this failed and left Strange in a weakened state with no magic left on the planet for him to use his powers. Coming in at number 2, we have Wonder Woman. Strength is a cornerstone of this character and with the loss of her powers it was shown that she can represent that in more ways than one. In the 70s, Wonder Woman willingly gave up her powers because she sought to follow her heart. If she was to stay the super powered goddess, it would mean she would have to return to Themyscira and leave behind the heartthrob Steve Trevor. In her newly depowered state, she didn't give up her life of hero work. She went on to study a new martial art, probably making her even more powerful in the long run. I mean, if you can kick someone's butt while you're just regular flesh and blood, then when you pack some super powered juice into that, you can start knocking people out like 19 year old Mike Tyson. Part of the change to this character was to coincide with the women's movement that was happening in the 70s. DC Comics wanted to represent a strong female character that could be closer associated to the female readers that were picking up the comic. And for the number one spot we have Wolverine. It would be pretty hard to be Wolverine without the powers. I mean even take Superman. On a few occasions he has been stripped of his powers and he's still that boy scout at heart and will do what's right no matter what. 
But with Wolverine, a big part of his personality is being able to be punched in the face and come back like nothing happened, which probably made the loss of his powers even more interesting. Back in 2013, Wolverine was infected with a very advanced virus that attacked his healing factor. It basically made him so he was just a regular guy. Well, a regular guy that could probably still crank out under pull-ups. But this was so severe that he couldn't even use his claws anymore, so he had wrist-mounted claws. I guess you can take the powers out of the Wolverine, but you can't stop him from trying to slice people in half. Now this level of aggression without the healing factor backing him up eventually led to his death. Kicking off the list at number 10, The Man of Steel, Superman. Superman Batman Volume 1 Issue 44, the strange favor storyline begins with a movie shoot. How exciting, I wonder what they're filming. Well, they're filming a Superman Batman movie called World's Finest, which has a pretty good ring to it. I'm already intrigued. It feels like Tropic Thunder almost at first. These guys, these other guys are playing these superheroes. Batman's being played by a former Bond actor in that universe, Jason Wish, and he's going for it. His eyes are all watery. He's explaining this made up origin and Superman offside, like the Superman and the Batman are watching them film from afar. And Batman isn't really into this whole idea. He doesn't like how they don't know his true story and now they're just making stuff up. But Superman reassures them that it's only because they're interested in the mysterious bat. Out of nowhere, Livewire comes in, who's almost as evil as LimeWire, almost. And then she takes Jason as hostage, demanding that she receives half of his $12 million pay, which is a pretty big chunk of money. Robert Pattinson's only getting $5 million for the next Batman, but he's getting 20 for Batman 2, so it's, it's okay. So the Superman flies down and intervenes, and then he gets surprised when the prop kryptonite on set gets blasted with electricity and in turn explodes, leaving pieces of Superman's only weakness stuck in his face. I love how they have real kryptonite on set. That's good, that's commitment. It's like when they use real bones instead of props in the original Poltergeist movie. What could possibly go wrong, right? Number nine, the Wasp. We'll get the appetite going right off the bat here, okay. Janet Van Dyne, AKA the Wasp, first appeared in comics in Tales to Astonish, issue 44. Genetically engineered by Dr. Hank Pym, Ant-Man, with the help of Pym particles and biosynthetic wings, now Janet was one of the founding members of the Avengers. Not too shabby. She could generate bioelectric blasts from her hand, knocking down even the fiercest of foes. But when the blob gets a hold of her in the Ultimatum storyline, her sting just wouldn't cut it. The story comes from the Ultimates, which is already just a darker take on all of our characters and all those stories, and in it we see Earth's mightiest meeting their violent end. As for the Wasp, during the flood in New York City, she ended up being separated from the team, and when they finally found her, it was too late. She had become a midnight snack. Hank decides to get payback in a similar manner. Giant Man then grabs the blob, and Ozzy Osbourne's his head right off. Payback is gross, but necessary. And before we continue on with this list, let's brighten the mood a little bit. Maybe go and hit that thumbs up. I don't know, get some spirits back to normal. Also, it helps the channel out so much. You're the best, thank you so much. Back to this dark list. Number eight, Batman. Coming from the 1993 Batman Nightfall storyline, we get to meet Bane in a terrifying way. He literally broke Batman. The beast started by making Batman's worst day come to life as he freed every villain in Arkham Asylum, so now Batman's gotta try and round up all those psychopaths, which is already exhausting, and Batman's weaker now, mentally and physically. And when Bane goes to the Batcave, because yes, he knows Batman's secret identity, he beats Bruce down, and when the moment is right, he lifts the Cape Crusader above his head and drops him down onto his knee, breaking his back. Now this was a huge moment in the comics. When Batman goes down for the count, the mantle was then passed along to Azrael. And we just broke down a bunch of alternate versions of Batman in the last week or two, so make sure you go and check out one of those three lists as well after you're done here. Batman has had quite the run in comics. Interesting time. Next on the list we have Storm, one of the coolest comic book characters ever created. I've always been a fan of any hero who has Storm powers because there is so much you can do with them. Got a fire? Bring in some rain. Got a big monster? Hit it with some lightning. Got a town? that needs clean energy, build a windmill, and then create some wind. But in Uncanny X-Men issue 185, Storm would no longer be the queen of weather. This was because the future mutant Forge worked with Henry Peter Gyrich to come up with a weapon that could be used to neutralize a mutant's powers. See, Gyrich was a little bit peeved because Rogue had recently gotten into a major conflict with S.H.I.E.L.D. This led to Gyrich attempting to depower Rogue with this newly crafted weapon, but a misfire led to it hitting Storm. After Hulk, we have 
Thor. The Asgardian has always had a lot of family problems. If he's not fighting with his brother, it's with his dad or his sister. On one occasion, Odin thought it was time to teach Thor a tough lesson. Because Thor is insanely powerful, he's always walked around as a brutish thug who wants to punch first and ask questions later. Odin thought it was time that he learned some empathy for those who aren't able to wield a hammer that was made out of a fallen star. So he stripped him of his power and then sent him to Earth. Now Thor might have walked around like an angry kid who wants to have cookies for breakfast, but Odin solved this problem by also wiping his memory. This way Thor would be forced to be a real person and see what it's like to feel and act like a normal person. Of course he eventually got his memory back and returned to the mantle of God of Thunder. Number three, Green Lantern. Now this one comes from Justice League issue five. It's been referred to as the punch since. In this comic, Batman comes in to take over the Justice League International and Guy Gardner Green Lantern doesn't share the same enthusiasm as the rest of the team. For more than one issue, he makes it very clear that he doesn't like this new leader. So naturally this conflict was growing and although Batman was obviously a better fit for the role, he challenged Batman to a fight without the use of his power ring and then Batman proceeded to knock him out with one punch. Of course, he's Batman, and without the ring, you're just a guy. You're just a regular guy gardener. Blue Beetle even jumped up. He got pumped, and he started yelling, one punch, one punch, one punch, just adding insult to injury, literally. This is a great moment, an even greater lesson, but Green Lantern getting knocked out by a human punch shouldn't have happened in the first place. Don't start fights you can't win without the only thing that makes you win those fights. I don't know, just my advice. Number two, Martian Manhunter. In Final Crisis 1, John Jones' Martian Manhunter gets trapped in a prison. See, he originally went there undercover as John Jones in his human form and would regularly report back to Batman. That's when the villains decided to break free and then he was left behind. It's not looking good at this point because Human Flame had now given the villain Libra instructions to kill Martian Manhunter. So Libra went and he did so. He stabbed Martian Manhunter with a staff right in front of the entire staff, the entire secret society of supervillains. And then upon his death, he returned back to his Martian form. And in his final moments, he still managed to send that message back to the Justice League. Not even death will stop this guy's plans. The Justice League held his funeral on his home planet, Mars, with Superman giving the eulogy. His final moments were expanded on in the Final Crisis Requiem storyline, teaching us more about his homeworld and the inhabitants of it. You can find this in Justice League Volume 2 in issues 6 and 7. And finally, number one, my personal favorite, Wolverine. I mentioned Wolverine getting something bad. This is it, now we're gonna talk about it. This next one comes from Punisher Volume 6, issue 17, appropriately titled, Aim Low, written by Garth Ennis. So we find Wolverine with his face, well, without a face, his face is gone at this point. He got his face blown off by the Punisher, and you'd think that would be pretty bad, but it of course gets so much worse. Frank Castle fixes his aim a little bit lower and then pulls the trigger, reassuring Logan that they'll grow back. Frank was trying to get Wolverine out of the way and this put him down for a bit, definitely, but he's still not out for the count just yet. Never turn your back on the knucklehead. Wolverine is literally crawling towards the Punisher now. He's like, shoot me, bomb me, cut me up, I don't care, I'm just gonna keep coming at you. Well, it's kinda hard to move when there's a steamroller on top of you, no? The fact that he did it slowly too, starting with the feet and then slowly moving it up to his head and then putting it in park when it was on his head, I can't even fathom what this would feel like. I can't pull a hangnail some days. Like a steamroller? What kind of Austin Powers way to go out is that? 